welcome again. My name is Jim Bensley. I direct the Office of International Services and Service Learning here at the college, and I also teach in the Humanities Department. You've just been watching a number of photos from a few of our study abroad programs that we've run during the past couple of years. As you may have noticed up there, there were a lot of smiling faces. But behind those faces lies something even more powerful. In my job, I'm lucky enough to read many journal reflections from students who have journeyed overseas on academic study abroad programs. When I review their day-to-day -day entries, I begin to notice changes start happening. Confidence grows. Teamwork skills are enhanced. Communication improves. Flexibility and patience are understood. And most importantly, cultural understanding is developed. And when you really think about it, aren't those the exact type of soft skills employers are looking for in today's global economy? For a variety of reasons, a majority of community colleges are only involved in short-term study abroad experiences that usually range from two to six weeks. However, what I tend to see time and time again are students whose desire to participate in longer multicultural opportunities following graduation has just been ignited. In fact, I often tell people, our job is to spark the fire. A student's inquisitiveness will fan the flames, and future opportunities may just light up the world. As much as we would like all students to have some type of intercultural experience, financing, especially at the community college level, can be difficult. That is why, following the presentation, we will have representatives at the doors with envelopes from the NMC Foundation earmarked with the NMC Global Opportunities Scholarship, a particular gift initially set up by President Nelson and his wife Nancy to support the su successful acquisition of skills in order for a student to thrive in a global society. This scholarship has also en been enhanced through the annual donation from the International Affairs Forum, specifically to be targeted to first-generation college students. Should you feel compelled, please consider helping support international education at NMC. And now it is with great pleasure that I introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Alan Goodman. However, before I do, we would like to offer a special thank you to another International Affairs Forum board member, Steve Fisher, for making the initial contact with Alan. Steve used to serve on the IIE Board of Trustees. And it was, it was rather humorous. I had missed an, an IEF meeting in May because I was overseas with my students. And I came back, and I was talking to Karen, and she said, oh, you should look and see who we've got for fall. And I'm like, Alan Goodman? <laughs> this guy is, is exactly who we would love to have. Um, the Institute for International Education was founded in 1919. Since that time, the Institute has become the number one organization for promoting and arranging international educational experiences including the venerated Fulbright program. While we typically think of American students going abroad, IIE also brings countless students to America, including rescued scholars threatened by war, terrorism, and repression, and others from, and we were just talking to Alan, artists as well. All told, alumni of institute-administered programs, as well as the IIE trustees and advisors, have won 78 Nobel Prizes over the years. I had the honor of meeting Dr. Goodman two weeks ago, and it's clear that his leadership is responsible for much of the groundbreaking work of the Institute for International Education. He is personally invested in cultural and educational understanding between peoples of the world. Years ago, he was the first American professor to lecture at the Foreign Affairs College of Beijing. He helped create the first U.S. academic exchange program with the Moscow Diplomatic Academy and developed the diplomatic training program of the Foreign Ministry of Vietnam. More recently, he has worked tirelessly to save scholars in war-torn countries such as Iraq and Syria. Noting in a recent interview, you never know if the life you save might be a life that saves multiple lives. Dr. Goodman holds a doctorate in government from Harvard and has also served as the Executive Dean of Foreign Service and as a professor at Georgetown University. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, 
we are in for an extremely informative and inspiring program. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Alan Goodman. Thank you very much. Don't, don't go too far. Uh, uh, it's clear I went to the wrong Northwestern for my college. <laughs> because you've got in Jim and in Tim Nelson, uh, two people that are really committed to internationalization of both the campus and opportunities for their students to study abroad. Uh, my Northwestern dean, when he looked at my transcript, said, I think you could use a little more work here at home. And it was the last thought on earth that I would ever get a passport or travel abroad. So it really matters when you have a professor like Jim, a president like Tim with a great board behind him and both of them to say that international ought to be part of everybody's education at Northwestern. And uh, the Institute wanted to recognize uh, with an award, uh, Mr. President, if you join me up here. This recognizes Northwestern Michigan for achieving a real milestone in committing themselves to double the number of their students that study abroad and help us in other ways to make sure that internationalization becomes part of education. You're one of a handful of colleges this year that have achieved that milestone already. We're working on getting all of them to achieve it by the end of the decade, but it's my privilege to present you with our seal of excellence. <laughs> Will you say a, a few words? Please. Well, thank you, Alan, and uh, I will uh, say this could not happen without people like Jim and without faculty and staff. Uh, Jim told me this afternoon that by the end of this summer we will have sent over 300 students, faculty and staff to, on international experiences over the last five years. Uh, and our goal is to have everyone in this college have some type of experience in the international arena. Uh, it is the world in which they live and these are skills that they need to have. So I'm looking forward to your speech, looking forward to a long uh, and fruitful affiliation with IE and uh, we'll do great things together, so thank, thank you. Thank you. It's our privilege. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you so much. As I was mentioning to uh, Tim when we met this afternoon in his office, it, I, I do visit a lot of colleges and universities, increasingly community colleges, and it really is pretty rare to sit down with the president of a community college who whose agenda is my agenda, whose agenda is making international part of education. These colleges have many other pressures and many other constituencies and needs to serve, but, but we both agreed that this is part of making the next generation ready to work in an intercultural, multicultural world and to help them have the skills, not only that you get in the classroom, but the experience of sitting next to and working with somebody from Brazil or India, Argentina, uh, China, uh, and, and that's what our people are going to need more and more uh, wherever they start and wherever they finish in their higher education voyage. So uh, tomorrow, uh, thanks to Tim, we're also going to have a roundtable for, I believe, 20 or 25 college, community college presidents here in Michigan that are coming up here to Northwestern to talk about best practice and internationalization strategies, how what I'm seeing here could be applied in other settings and how many of their students and faculty could be applying for the international grants that we in the Institute have the privilege to administer. So uh, it's a privilege to be here tonight and it's really gonna be terrific to be back on campus tomorrow for that round table. I'd like to begin by giving everybody a quiz. Uh, would you raise your hand if you have a passport? Just keep them up. If everybody on this side would put the hand down, and uh, everybody in this big section in the middle, 
would you put your hands down? This side you can, you, you passed. Uh, that's about the proportion of Americans today that have a passport. Uh, about 38% of Americans have a passport. We, we know from the demographics that of that 38%, half are older than the age of 60. So they have gotten a passport to take the tour with other Americans, usually to an English-speaking country. Uh, uh, I talked with many of the audience uh, at the refreshments before, and I was struck by how many said my granddaughter or my grandson is now studying abroad, some in high school, some in college. Uh, uh, Three percent of Americans today study abroad for credit. Out of 20 million Americans in higher ed, it is a tiny, tiny number. And it's particularly small when you stratify it by community college and research universities. Uh, uh, and, and it's hardly the proportion or the number that we would all agree, given what we're doing for our grandkids, that ought to be what Americans are doing for the next generation and for the time in which they're going to work. So five years ago, we launched an initiative, and, and Northwestern Michigan is part of it and won the seal of excellence for achieving its objectives already, uh, is to double the number of Americans studying abroad in this decade, to go from about 250,000 to 500,000. We called it our moonshot uh, because it's, it's difficult to do. Uh, uh, it's an ambitious objective, uh, and if we left to our own devices just the normal rate of growth of study abroad in America, we would double the number of Americans studying abroad uh, by around 2037. So we really can't rely on just normal programs, normal attention to this. It really does take a president. It really does take a faculty champion like Jim. It really does take alumni coming back and saying it was transformative for me and it can be transformative for you. If we even have a prayer of trying to go from 250,000 to half a million. And of course, that's really not even adequate given how interconnected our world and work in the 21st century is going to be. So one way we thought of doing this is maybe we could invent it ourselves. We could invent the roadmaps to 2020, the roadmaps to doubling the numbers studying abroad, and then we realized that uh, every campus is a little different. And that's how we got to the campaign of which uh, Northwestern today is recognized for achieving, is you tell us how you might want to do it. You tell us what a significant increase would mean in your setting and your campus. Uh, we have some very large state systems, uh, the SUNY system in New York and the Wisconsin state system. And what, what they said, uh, for example, is we're not going to focus on uh, Stony Brook and Madison. We're going to focus on White River Junction and New Paltz. We're going to focus on campuses that traditionally have not sent a lot of students in study abroad programs, make it easier for them to do. Other campuses said, um, we, we're sending quite a few students abroad, but nobody with physical disabilities. Now, let's figure out how we can make it available to them where they can be hosted and how they can also participate as persons with a disability in the world that we share. Uh, we had one very interesting uh, uh, school in Pennsylvania that uh, said um, our biggest problem is the bro problem. The bro are the brothers who get together and rent an off-campus housing in their junior year when they normally would go abroad. And then one of the bros comes home uh, at the end of the sophomore year and has just won a scholarship someplace. 
and the three other roommates say, you're going to leave us? You're going to not live with us next year? You're going to China or India or France or London? Uh, th that's devastating. You can't leave us, bro. A and so there was a sociological study done of what is the gender bias that, and, and the dynamic that's at work, and, and then what could people like Jim and others in international study abroad offices do to sort of counteract, uh, it's okay. Uh, you can Skype with your bro every, and we'll find you another roommate to fill the apartment. Uh, uh, we worked uh, with another large state institution uh, in Mississippi uh, because uh, they have a lot of sports in Mississippi, and they have a lot of really big teams in Mississippi. Um, the only problem is if you're playing Division I anything in Mississippi, it's a 13-month-a-year sport. Uh, you may only play for two months, but you can't be. And they figured out a way to print the athletic schedule so that they're in, in bold print says, if you want to study abroad, these are the quarters or these are the months that you can go and the coaches aren't going to be mad at doing it. Uh, Mississippi State uh, was pretty famous in women's basketball. Uh, and uh, I said, I bet the women's basketball team doesn't have a passport. Let's, let's have a campaign to get all the players a passport. And they said, oh, you're too late. We did that two years ago. And they come and pose at the Office of International Studies as a whole team uh, with their jerseys and their passports saying, if we did it, you can too. And the study abroad office now is a passport office. So it, it's a place where the student gets their picture for free, and instead of having to turn to post office and find the right day when the postal agent is going to take the passport office, the study abroad office is able to accept the application, and then it gets processed in, I believe it's in New Hampshire. So through this effort, we've learned so many things we had no idea uh, mattered that help overcome the obstacles. So another big set of obstacles, apparently, are parents. It <clears throat> turns out that every student has a parent. Uh, some grandparents. Uh, and one of our trustees said, uh, you know, you have all these books and guides for study abroad for the students. You ought to write a book on a guide to study abroad for parents. Uh, it's actually our best-selling book because college advisors are giving out this book right and left uh, as it turns out the parent says, well, you work so hard to get to this college, often first generation, uh, maybe you should stay at home or I'm not sure, I've just heard about a terrorist incident in, in, in Europe and maybe it's not safe to go abroad or you can't afford to do this. Uh, and the book helps the student make the case to the parent that, yes, I can, and this is how we can do it, and, and registrar has already said I'm not going to lose credits for it. Sometimes credits are the obstacle. Uh, yeah, I said it is our best-selling book uh, uh, because we publish it in English and Spanish. And for the first time, we're reaching the parents of first-generation college attendees who may not actually have the time to read through all the rules and regulations, but if we could do this in a simple guide, it helps the student make the case that this is uh, something that will help me. A couple of reasons why we think Americans ought to study abroad. Uh, I call it the 70% rule. 70% uh, of college American students today cannot find Iran on a map, nor Iraq, nor Israel. And 70% of college-educated Americans, 18 to 24, uh, believe they have located the world's newest country called South Sudan, either in South America or Southeast Asia. Uh, we used to joke that 70% uh, of students today also couldn't name the Secretary General of the United Nations. 
still can't. Um, and most don't even have a clue that it's not coffee anon anymore. Uh, we are doing better when the National Geographic asks, uh, can you name the president of Russia? <laughs> now, he's sticking around for a long time. He's in the news a lot. Apparently, he was running for election here in the United States. <laughs> so his name is more familiar, but, but generally our young people are not in the college experience getting the kind of touch of the kind of world we share or the experience, unless we bring a lot of international students here, or the experience of living and working alongside people from a much wider intercultural dimension. I like to say we're a faith-based organization at IIE or at Fulbright because we believe these experiences transform you. And we used to believe that if you learned the other language, if you studied abroad for a whole year, uh, you came back transformed. And, and that was true. Uh, but you can be a student at a community college and go for a, a 10 day trip led by one of your faculty members. <clears throat> Maybe it's the first time you've been out of state. 58% uh, of American college students go to school today within 50 miles of home. Maybe it's the first time out of state. Maybe it's the first time on an airplane. Maybe it's the reason you get a passport. But two weeks of a study visit with a faculty member studying abroad somewhere, uh, when you come back, you also feel you're different. Uh, uh, every data indicator we have is that if you study abroad, especially if you're a minority student, you graduate faster than your peers do, closer to your original target with a higher GPA, and you have a job offer within six months of graduation. Uh, and I, ask, I keep asking students, what is the secret sauce that sometimes makes the difference, uh, knowing how you, you have to operate on your own, outside of a culture zone, realizing that people think and process information differently. And one put it very simply, uh, uh, this experience, the 10-day experience that went from Detroit Community College to the Automotive Technical Institute in, in, in Germany uh, to compare how we diagnose and repair car problems, meant that I had to get my act together. I had to get a passport. I had to find out who had my birth certificate. I had to make arrangements for what. And that life skill of getting, quote, my act together, when they came back, enabled them to get all the credits assembled, go to the registrar, and graduate on time. Uh, so even a short-term experience leads to life-enhancing, job-enhancing skills that that our young people keep telling us uh, that they need. Uh, it also sometimes brings a dividend that you, you, you just don't expect. Uh, we're privileged for the State Department to administer the, uh, a scholarship named after Congressman Benjamin Gilman. And it is for students who are Pell eligible students. And to your Pell grant, the scholarship enables us to add 5,000 more dollars uh, so that you can take your Pell Grant, the $5,000, and study abroad for a semester. And we add also a little more money to help with travel. Uh, and uh, I never, I've, I've never forgotten talking to one uh, community college student, uh, then went on to UT in Texas, uh, I decided to apply for a Gilman, uh, and went from San Antonio to Thailand. And I was most curious as to, well, we, we know what your Pell Grant is. The Gilman added another 5,000. Uh, how, what was your budget like? How, how much air ticket? What did you figure? And he said, oh, I saved money on the trip. And I had to because I'm helping my mother in her business and I've got two siblings at home. Uh, but I could go all the way from San Antonio to Thailand for four months and come back with all my credits, uh, everything counted, and everything was whole. And I said, that was great. Uh, uh, and then he said, but the most important thing I learned 
was on the streets in Thailand. Uh, people were advertising on the streets uh, 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 cleaning services. My mother, he said, runs a cleaning sort of a household cleaning service in 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 Texas. Uh, had had when he left uh, six employees and. And he said, in Thailand, you know, they advertise, uh, you can make the appointment for the cleaning service on a mobile phone. And the cleaning services that are doing really well say, all our products are green. All environmentally friendly. No plastic dumping, no toxic chemicals. Uh, uh, and he came back and he said, Mom, what do you think? Maybe you ought to go mobile, and you ought to say, we're only going to use green products. It doesn't cost much more to do that. Uh, they now have about 80 employees. Uh, it's a booming business. Um, I suppose he could have learned this any place in the world, but it's funny what you notice when you're out of your comfort zone, you're out of your normal place, and you see things and say, gee, maybe we could do that back home. And so often with our Fulbright alumni, which we also administer for the State Department, a Fulbrighter will come back <clears throat> to the local community and do something in that community or in that school system because they saw it in Germany or they saw it in India. Said, gee, I wonder maybe we could do that back here. <clears throat> we had one Fulbright alumna who uh, came from Amman Jordan to uh, Iowa, to the University of Iowa. She's a molecular, cell molecular biologist. Uh, uh, very unusual Fulbright grant because she had four children. And usually a student grant uh, doesn't go to uh, a young woman still working on her PhD uh, and bringing four children along. But the beauty of Fulbright is that it, it, it does and the commission there selected her. Uh, she since won many awards uh, in cell molecular biology. She's an associate professor at the Hashemite University in Jordan. She had a postdoc at Yale, also on a Fulbright. Uh, what did she bring back to Jordan? Well, she asked her kids what was the best part of living in Iowa. And they said, story hour. Uh, and every couple of days, and certainly on the weekends, the story hour was the kids would go to the library, and the mothers would read to the groups of kids, and, and her kids just loved it, and said, Mom, let's have a story hour for Jordan. Seems simple enough. Uh, first, uh, she realized there are no libraries in Jordan, like neighborhood libraries here. There are libraries at universities, and you have to be a university student or professor to use them. No community libraries. Uh, OK, she found some community centers and buildings that could be designated community centers and libraries, and found a lot of Americans living in Iowa who remembered her and said, I'll send you the books. She got all the books. Um, and then she needed to find mothers who could read. And most of the mothers in their immediate neighborhood were illiterate. And so she discovered she had to create a teaching program to teach mothers how to read so that they could read the books to the kids, as well as read then the documents that their husbands were asking them to sign, <clears throat> which they had no ability to read. So, this turned into a community center building project, a uh, mother's literacy project, a preschool safe zone activity project. It now works in 22 countries and probably reaches 100,000 kids a year. Her Fulbright was in cell molecular biology. Uh, but sometimes the magic happens and you bring things back home that you would never have expected you would be doing, um, and, and that's her story. Uh, uh, a final uh, uh, e example of what these exchange programs do that, that, that surprises. Uh, 
A couple of years ago, we gave a dinner for the Fulbright students in China. And my good fortune was to sit next to a PhD student from Ohio State University. And uh, she uh, studying environmental science, doing a PhD in environmental science, and her project was organisms in Chinese river water. She assured me there was no shortage of organisms in Chinese river water. And she's living in a very remote village, and I had said, well, how far was it from Beijing where our dinner was? So she said, I had a walk for about half a day, then uh, I took a horse cart, then a bus, then a train, then a plane, and finally I got to Beijing, and I really felt terrible. I mean, dinner with me ain't so, it ain't worth all of that effort. And they said, oh, I wasn't coming here to see you. And immediately I realized what it was all about. She was coming with water samples and going to bring them to the national lab and get them tested. That wasn't it either. Uh, she said, I'm here to arrange for a surgery for little Liang. In her village, she's, uh, and, and I think Jim uh, Frick, who was a Fulbrighter in southern Siberia, would identify with this. She was the only American, like within a million miles, of, in a very remote part of China. And Liang's uh, father was killed in a car crash, and his, her mother was <clears throat> severely injured in a car crash, and so was little Liang, and she needed a neurosurgical operation that was impossible to do in, and she really had no family. The mother uh, was incapacitated, the father dead. Uh, and so this Ohio State PhD student becomes the medical missionary, finds a group of Baptists in Beijing uh, that said, let's go to the Mennonite hospital, uh, and was arranging for the surgery. And I, I forgot to bring the picture, but uh, she's about 14 years old now, and without Fulbright and this Ohio State student, she would be dead. Uh, that was never in the Fulbright plan for environmental organisms in Chinese river water fieldwork. But it's what Americans do. And, and, and this woman is probably the only time that people in this remote Chinese village will have ever had the chance to meet an American. It probably was true in your case in, in Siberia. And they will always remember it was uh, Jim or Heather that saved this or did that, and that Americans are not, despite what may be the propaganda, Americans are people that, just like us, uh, do amazing things and care for others. So almost every study abroad experience contains one of those things that uh, is so far from the academic and so close to what it makes to be global citizens. That, that's why uh, Jim and Tim and I feel so strongly and so passionately that it really ought to be part of everybody's education. And we need, as college administrators, to find ways to make that happen. And I think you're finding, we're finding it out through the efforts of Northwestern here. And all the colleges that are part, we have now 800 uh, colleges and universities that are part of the commitment to generation study abroad to make it possible for Americans. So let me close with uh, just, because uh, I really would like to take as many questions as you have. Uh, one, one of the preposition questions uh, is, so what if I had three minutes with uh, President Trump? And how would I defend programs like this? And uh, one of them is a, a number that you heard Jim say, uh, 79 Nobel Prizes. Uh, uh, actually, a third of all the Nobel Prizes won by Americans were won by Americans who were born in another country. And we now have 81 Nobel Prizes, uh, uh, Fulbright alumni, other programs, and institute activities were associated with. Uh, uh, anybody here have an MRI? So that was one of, the, uh, one of the scholars we rescued from the Nazis in the 1930s. He invented the physics that led to the process of an MRI and won a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, 
Uh, sometimes you never know the life that you save goes on to save many others. Uh, uh, but, but I would first start with, uh, uh, with a number like, how many Nobel Prizes do you want America to win? Because you're going to win them by opening our doors to others and by giving the opportunity for our students as graduate students to go to another country's lab or setting and discover something that they come back and, and advances us all. I guess the other thing I'd say is, uh, uh, I don't know about your business, uh, uh, but in mine, 36 billion is a big number. And that is what we estimate now to be the value that international students pay to American colleges, universities, and communities for coming here. Uh, three quarters of international students pay their own way. Uh, very few come on US or other government scholarships. Uh, uh, they come because Fulbright is known globally uh, not everyone can get a Fulbright, but we have more than a million international students now in America. Uh, they contribute in this state $1.1 billion in the, again, the tuition, the room and board uh, that they pay. Uh, and, and the Department of Commerce uh, rates education as our fifth largest export of services, measuring this, the value of to our balance of payments of what international students bring. But it's not all about numbers. It, if, it is all really about how we want to prepare the next generation for the world we share. And that's really the business that uh, Jim, Tim, and I are really in. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Goodman. That uh, was very interesting. Of course, I'm going to love that. But what I ask you, sitting in the audience today, is to remember what Dr. Goodman just told us. And if you have a chance to talk to neighbors who have students who are in college and perhaps considering or may not be considering this, tell them to consider the opportunity of venturing out. It may be scary. Um, they may not feel comfortable with it, but there are a lot of resources to help, not only here, but other places as well. And Michigan does a great job at that as a state. So we'd like to take some time now for you to ask a few questions. So if you do have some questions asked, we have some people with microphones coming around, and Alan will. Uh, yes, Dr. Goodman, you mentioned that 3% of the American study abroad, are there comparable figures for other countries, like China, for example, of what they do in sending students abroad? Thank you. It, uh, there are, we, we t Europe is about, 15 to 20 percent, Australia about the same. Uh, China is uh, very interesting because it is now the world's largest country sending students all around the world uh, and the world's lar second largest country in receiving students. Uh, you, uh, usually it's the U.S. is the first destination, the U.K. second, France, Germany, Italy, uh, this year, China's going to be number two in terms of receiving students. So, so most other, uh, certainly of the OECD countries, the 21, 22 European and Asian countries uh, that are the most developed, we're the least developed in terms of sending our people to study abroad. I think I see a mic heading in that direction. Um, yeah, it's, on, it's, on. it's very interesting to me because I have some personal experience with this. Um, Dr. Goodman, my youngest son uh, graduated University of Michigan and then he went into the Peace Corps and then he came back and he graduated Georgetown with his master's in the Foreign Service. So right now he is working for a nonprofit company in, well, set up in DC, but goes all over the world Great. setting up um, projects, Guatemala, Honduras. So 
um, I go back to um, reading him stories about all over the world. There's a series called Tintin that we read when he was young. Um, he also um, participated in a lot of the geography um, games when we were young. And at the college here, of course, the academic world quest program is fantastic. It's absolutely a fantastic way for kids to study about geography and what the world means to us. So I thoroughly encourage grandparents, um, parents, to think in those terms and to start early and to continue on with them because you never know where those seeds go. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. And one of the things at uh, IIE is we ask all new members joining the team to find somebody that is younger than themselves and doesn't have a passport and help them get a passport. We can help them figure out where to go and how to use it. And, and it's just the act of uh, getting a passport. Sometimes it, it, it begins to start the wheels turning. And we've now had a 1,000 uh, high school teachers said, we're committing to get our high school students uh, before they graduate, before they finish their senior year, every one of them will get a passport. Uh, and, and that's the driving license of the 21st century. And, and, and if we can plant the seed in high school, uh, we'll get more results in college because it's much too late when you're a junior uh, to begin thinking about studying abroad. You've, it, it, it's difficult to, to fit it in and, and not one size fits all, but uh, I think you're absolutely right, planting the seeds earlier and as, as we get to the end of generation study abroad, we hope to have many more high school teachers involved with us planting that seed, so thank you. Thank and you thank again. your son for the Peace Corps service. Dr. Goodman, what, is, what are the effects of the enhanced visa vetting programs on scholarly and cultural exchanges? We, we are in a period when we're all asking that question, and, and actually none of us yet have results. Uh, uh, we thought the period from August to September, uh, when new international students and scholars were coming to campus, would, would produce, as it did after 9-11, many anecdotes, horror stories, worries, things and we would hear from many campuses, uh, the student we admitted couldn't come, the faculty member didn't get a visa. Uh, and and I, 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 so we had our fingers crossed. It, you did a great job. Your colleges and universities had a, you were a welcome campaign, uh, uh, reinforced the message over the, when people were deciding between America and Australia, or should I go to school in a red state or a blue state? And admissions programs and presidents were making videos and sending out, again, the word that you really are welcome in America. And U.S. embassies were publishing their visa issuance rates so that it could be, not that the past is a predictor of the future, but it would be clear that we are issuing visas. And, and we, we had uh, very few incidents, uh, uh, very much fewer than after 9-11. Uh, where next year will be and the following year uh, is a different question because there's a mix of things affecting the decision to come here. Uh, one is any time a country changes its visa policy regulations. And we are hearing a lot of horror stories um, about students wanting to go to Britain. Uh, because the British government has, had, has made a commitment to reduce by 100,000 new immigrants, and they're counting students as potential immigrants, and so it's been a tightening on student visas. Uh, but we're not hearing it here yet. Uh, but we are hearing that cost is an issue, and for several years we've known that cost is, a, is an issue, and cost will only, unless we find a way to make public education free in America, 
and we have had some people run for president on that platform. Unless we find a way to do that, cost seems to only go up, and that, that is beginning to affect people's calculus. Uh, and the other is safety. Uh, 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 for the past couple of years, uh, I've been getting, uh, can you carry a gun on campus? Question, does everybody in Texas carry a gun? Does everybody in America have a gun? Uh, five years ago, I didn't get that question. But given the incidence of mass shootings and how that's uh, broad, how that is news all over the world, uh, for the first time we're getting the real, will, will I be safe? Uh, and it's not, will I be safe in one state versus another? It's, uh, does, is America a gun culture and does everybody have one? And if you go to the internet or go to the movies, uh, chances are you're gonna see uh, a lot of gun violence movies and that forms an impression in people's minds. So I think there are multiple things that are gonna affect the next couple of years and have been affecting the previous years, but this particular uh, August, September period was okay. It's Sir, uh, ah, ah, whoever has a mic, if they would just wave, great, thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, as residents of a state that has an international border, I would love to hear your comments about the value of students having at least a micro experience of perhaps going to Windsor, or um, there's a fabulous university in Montreal, and one can drive to Quebec and forego speaking English for the entire time that they're there. So your thoughts on that? So we have three kids. Uh, our youngest uh, did his whole undergraduate degree in Canada. Uh, and now lives and works in Canada. And, uh, uh, and when I was a dean at Georgetown, we instituted a, a foreign trip for everybody. Uh, it was a requirement that you had to take this foreign trip with me, and the trip was to Canada. Because they had a parliament, and they had question hour, and the prime minister got routinely raked over the coals, uh, and I thought it was useful for our students to see a parliamentary system at work, to see a multicultural, multilingual society and government operate. Uh, and, and so I, I very much agree with you that in North America, between Mexico and Canada, there are tremendous opportunities for our students that are close, that are affordable. And, and every place is a little different when you cross that border. And that, that's what I want our students to have the chance to realize. So if, if you can't find the funding to buy the air ticket to Europe or to China, it's possible to find the funding to buy the train ticket or the bus ticket to cross the border at Windsor and, and say to yourself, well, what's different about being here? Uh, what do they think of us as Americans? Uh, uh, didn't realize they had those feelings about America. Uh, what's in their newspapers? Uh, uh, we build a lot of Ford cars in Canada, apparently. I wonder if they build them differently than they do in Detroit. Uh, there's an awful lot of interest, uh, interesting things you can learn about yourself. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of wherever you go, uh, have that opportunity. Now, we, we have a really big problem that none of us have figured out how to solve, which are the DACA students. Uh, maybe born in America or America is the only place they know, but, but nobody knows what their future is going to be and they don't have a passport. 800,000 of them. And, and some, especially community colleges, Miami-Dade has led the way, has figured out ways with temporary certificates and other things to get some of the DACA students to go with the regular students and have an international experience and cross a border and come back uh, safely. But 800,000 is not a small number. Uh, and they're part of American higher education. Uh, if we have 20 million in higher education, they're 800,000 uh, of that 20 million. And, and we've got to figure out a way to accommodate their, their need to have an international experience uh, even though you would look at them and think, or hear them speak and think, oh, they're international already. They're not. They're only, the only country they know is ours. So I think, I think we have a lot to learn about how to make this available to all. Yes, sir. 
Uh, let me, uh, while he's getting the microphone, uh, share, uh, first of all, a short anecdote. Um, when Karen and I were serving at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, the deputy chief of mission was Jim Collins. And uh, he was a foreign exchange student in Moscow. Uh, and his roommate was Georgi Mamedov, who was the foreign minister of Russia. And uh, when we had a problem, uh, these two roommates would get on the phone to each other mm -hmm. and talk either in Russian or in English. It was, uh, they were both bilingual. And, and they were able to navigate through some, some complex uh, political problems. But it, it raises in my mind uh, how your organization might deal with when the relationships change. Because the relationship uh, that we had in those days with a new country, Russia, has changed to what we have with Russia today. How does that affect your programs? And uh, does, do we try to increase our presence, or, or are we fighting against resistance to that? I think the international education exchange space is, is a really, it works really well when countries love each other and the presidents were roommates and they, everybody's friendly. It works even better when they're not. Uh, we, and, and you know from your service and Karen's at the embassy, the Fulbright program operated all through the Cold War, uh, all through the most tense periods. Uh, and Fulbright operates pretty much everywhere in the world except Iran, North Korea, and Cuba. Uh, and, and a lot of governments and our government don't agree to things. Uh, and, and a lot of people may say, I don't like your foreign policy or your president, but never met anyone who said, I don't want your Fulbright. And it gives us, it be, because it's a two-way thing as well, it, uh, Americans get to go to places that they wouldn't normally get to go, whether it's southern Siberia or parts of China. Uh, and people from those parts of their countries that would never get the opportunity get to come here. So uh, I, I, I think of our 100 years of history, Fulbright is 71 years old. Even before Fulbright, we were, we were seeing the benefit, uh, even when countries were at, at significant odds with each other. Uh, and, and then it pays a dividend 10 or 20 years later uh, when people remember, ah, yes, I, uh, uh, I, I, I had that experience in Iowa. Americans are good people. They have good values. Maybe we can resolve this in a different way. Uh, uh, so uh, we, we, we're also known for kind of being the first NGO to go when there's just the beginning of an opening. So we were the first to take a delegation to China before diplomatic relations or to Vietnam. The first to go when Myanmar opened. I had the privilege of leading the first uh, academic delegation to Iran and President Rouhani when he uh, said it's time to start exploring people-to-people -people exchanges. Uh, and, and we've gone to some pretty on paper, hostile places. And uh, uh, the moment you say you're from America, and this happened uh, especially in Iran, uh, people would come over and crowd around you with an iPad and an iPhone. Let me take your picture. My uncle went to Iran. My, my, my uncle went to California. My cousin went to Michigan State. My aunt went to University of Michigan. They, th there are these ties that, that last through generations, and it builds a generation of, uh, of really goodwill. So uh, I, I, I think these programs operate especially well in difficult times and in difficult places. Uh, hello. Do you support uh, your students going into the Peace Corps? Absolutely, and we actually hire them when they come out. Uh, uh, prob probably Peace Corps Returned Peace Corps volunteers are one of the biggest, uh, biggest sources of people who work on our teams and want to work in international education. But uh, I, I think we should have mandatory service for all Americans, uh, whether it's the military, the Peace Corps, or a volunteer in your community. It should be part of what an educated citizenry does. Uh, uh, and 
we have some programs where there is a service requirement. Uh, uh, for the fellowship, you have to commit to a year of service in the United States government. Uh, and and I, I, I think we should have more of those and, and, more, and, and encourage more and more young people uh, before college, during college, and after to, to, to have this service. Mr. Goodman, I'm over here. Hi. Uh, you mentioned about uh, parents and coaches and so forth in your speech. Uh, I was the exchange officer of a Rotary Club for six years. And uh, one year we had a young man who we chose and uh, he was going to go to South America. Well, he called a couple of weeks later and he said, I cannot go, I'm so sorry. I said, why? Because my coach, I play baseball and he doesn't let me go. So I went over to the school and I talked to the coach and I said- I, I bet he got to go. <laughs> He did, yeah. he did, and he's a very successful young man now. I mean, he went out as a, as a shaking, uh, because he had never been outside of uh, Michigan, and uh, he was still very hesitant in a way, but he came back after a year abroad. He was a man. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I, I think the student and the coach owes you a lot. Uh, but I, when you see the advertisements, especially during basketball season, that uh, there are 500,000 members of the NCAA and 99% uh, of them will turn pro in something other than basketball because they want to demonstrate that athletics and academics go together. Uh, it always makes me mad because I also, uh, until we get all the coaches buy-in, there are 500,000 members of the NCAA, and unless the coach says you can study abroad, they ain't gonna study abroad. Uh, so that, that's why we have worked with them, and, and now academic, many athletic schedules will say, if you're gonna do this, and we encourage you to do it, this is the time you ought, ought to study abroad. Uh, Dr. Goodman, yes. we're here. <laughs> Thank you for all your comments. Um, I've, uh, I've lived abroad and studied abroad, and I'm a director of international programs at a community college here in Michigan. Ah. and support study abroad. Which one? Uh, Mid-Michigan Community College. Okay. And um, of course, I, I totally agree with the value of study abroad. It changed my life, and I see it changing the lives of students all the time. But I also know that uh, there's a lot of advances in technology, and we're seeing uh, virtual study abroad or virtual exchange programs where students will interact with people in other countries via technology. And although that can't replace study abroad for some of our students who who really can't financially or time-wise because they have kids or they, 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 have, uh, they have to work to study. Um, this might be the only opportunity that they get to engage with someone from another culture or country. Now, just wondering if you could give your thoughts on the idea of technology in international education and in virtual exchange. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we could ask Tim to say a word about the SOLIA program that works so well. Uh, Thank you, Tim. I actually use a program in my uh, World Cultures call, course called so the Solia Connect program. There are some of my students here today that have been involved with that. And what it does is for seven, eight weeks actually, my students get on online with students virtually online, so they see faces <clears throat> for two hours each week. And there's a facilitator that works with them and they discuss many things that have a multicultural significance. Things such as women's issues. You know, so if you get a student in Grand Traverse County that is speaking with someone that is in a coffee shop in Egypt, <clears throat> and to hear their insight into that, or to someone that is in Syria still, um, they really get a good idea of just what's going on in the world and how different it may be, or how similar oftentimes it can be. And that's the magic that happens with that. And so um, I would encourage any colleges, universities, high schools that um, have the aptitude to do this to get involved. Now right now there is, there is a cost obviously with technology. Um, we were able to write a grant and receive that and be able to do that. But I think that cost is gonna be coming down like many things. So 
Um, as I say, it's been effective for us. We are building a new building here at uh, Northwestern Michigan College called the 21st Century Innovation Center. That building will be aligned to offer these type of experiences for yeah. students who can't go overseas. And many of the DACA students that are seeking that experience today but can't go because of the documentation problem are turning to virtual exchange, and uh, Sulia is one of the best ways to do that. Uh, I got a personal experience that I would like to share with you and with auditorium. Uh, ah. I, I, came, I came to this country 50 years ago to continue my medical education. I, we founded a big organization, it's called the Peruvian American Medical Society. We are like 700 Peruvian doctors working in this country. And Great. we have come back to Peru for 40 years, and our group has operated more than 200 patients and trained the Peruvian doctors with the new technology. We introduced laparoscopic surgery, uh, CT scans, PET scans, everything. And we are continuing to do that. And that really reinforced the magnitude of those exchange programs. My wife, was an exchange student in Peru, and probably that was one of the reasons that I came here. <clears throat> there are many <laughs> side benefits of study abroad. Uh, we're currently operating two very large diaspora programs, uh, one funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the other by the Stavros Niarchos Foundation of Greece, but uh, we're identifying Americans uh, who were born in Africa and Americans who were born in Greece or of Greek descent that speak Greek or the tribal languages and can go to universities in Greece and Africa and teach the short courses that universities there can't fill because so many of their faculty as part of brain drain have left. Uh, it's an acute problem in Greece especially in the medical areas where so, when, when the economy uh, became really bad, uh, uh, so many uh, very accomplished uh, Greek professors left, came to America, uh, leaving huge gaps in, 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 in basic science courses and basic medical courses. And this program now finds the diaspora. Uh, I'm glad to hear about what you're doing in the case of Peru. I, I think part of what's making America great is so many of us have roots in another place and have skills that other place could use right now, and they're organizing and getting together to, to provide them. And, and I think that's a dimension of international education that will become more and more and more important in, in the future. So thank you. We have time for uh, two more questions. Here's one more. <laughs> uh, my family has hosted a number of foreign students over the years, but that was at a, a different time. You mentioned uh, qu questions that you're getting from parents of potential visiting students here. Uh, parents that asked about the prevalence of guns and the danger of guns. We know there are over 300 million guns out in, in society today. How, I'd be interested in, in hearing your answer to those parents to assure them of something. First, it's important to, I always try to say, uh, American colleges and universities uh, really do believe in international education and they really do welcome students and there is a mosque, a synagogue, a Hindu temple, a Buddhist temple, uh, a church and all the places you, you want to worship. Uh, secondly, the most dangerous thing your kid is going to do is when you drive them to the airport in your country to get on a plane and they get off the plane and somebody drives them from the airport to their dorm because uh, we're all in God's hands. Uh, it, it, you never know when the lightning is going to strike. Uh, but w w our campuses devote an enormous amount of effort, 
much more than to traffic safety that the society does to making sure that education is a safe and, 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 and secure space to be a student. And, 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 and people begin to realize that it can happen anywhere. Uh, it, it's not our policy to happen, to have it happen anywhere, uh, and that campuses in particular make a real effort uh, to keep the campus, the community, the students, all of their students, we have a duty of care after all, to keep them safe and secure. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we, we have 40,000 students under our programs and programs we administer for others probably every year. And, and uh, students uh, are harmed, students get ill, uh, some students are killed, and uh, the number one, two, and three reason is a road accident. Uh, and we, we just take driving and traveling on the road for granted. To, uh, so it, it's urging them to put in perspective that, that we have the kind of environment where your child can thrive, and we have a commitment to making that environment safe and secure. But I'll never forget the uh, uh, talking to an Iraqi parent. Uh, we started uh, the Fulbright program back up in Iraq uh, some years ago, and uh, the chance to travel several times to Iraq and uh, talking with the parents. Uh, uh, and, and when you go to Iraq, uh, there was for a time a, a stretch, a 10 kilometer stretch of highway was the most dangerous 10 kilometers in the world uh, from the airport to past uh, uh, Mukhtar al-Sadr city into, into Baghdad. Uh, many checkpoints, many bombs, many people with uh, guns visible, and, uh, and, and, and I talked to the father, and he said, I'm really worried about my son going to America. And here we are in the middle of Baghdad. Uh, going to America means going from Baghdad to the airport. Uh, and me, I'm thinking, gee, I'm really worried about going back to the airport. Um, and I said, you must be worried about that very dangerous stretch of road. And he said, no, oh, no, 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 we know how to do that. He said, but every movie I've ever seen about America uh, is with guns and about people killing. Is it really like that? And I think we have a lot of work to do to portray what America really is like. Uh, and the You Are Welcome Here campaign uh, is, is a really great way to start. So thank you for the question. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for Steve and Ann Fisher for inviting me. Thank you so much.